and welcome to the For We Are Many podcast. My name is Rob, and I think Trisha is frozen over there. Uh, my mic was muted. Oh. oh. I forgot about that. I had hiccups while the music was playing. <laughs> Hi, I'm Trisha. <laughs> and we will be your hosts for this evening. Uh, we are reading... Uh, Soul on Ice by Aldridge Cleaver. I was trying to remember what part this is. Six? Five? Something like that. Hold on. Hold on. It is on the section Initial Reactions on the part five of Malcolm X. Yes. There. And um. <clears throat> Sarah is making her usual guest appearance for some FaceTime. Fair enough. Uh, what was the name of the channel for this ebook? Exam Info is the name of the channel. As you see, we are subscribed and I rung the bell. Show them some love. Hell yeah. Um, do you want to say anything before we dive into it or just, just go for it? Let's just go for it. Right on. Um, we will have the link to the ebook um, and the audiobook in the description for this video. So if you want to read along or you want to listen to the audiobook on your own, you can. Reactions on the assassination. Of Malcolm X, Folsom Prison, June 19th, 965. Sunday is movie day at Folsom Prison, and I was sitting in the darkened hulk of mess hall number one, which convicts call the Folsom Theater, watching Victor Bruno in a movie called The Strangler. When a convict known as Silly Willie came over to where I was sitting and whispered into my ear. Brother Jay sent me in to tell you it just came over the TV that Malcolm X was shot as he addressed a rally in New York. For a moment the earth seemed to reel in orbit. The skin all over my body tightened up. How bad? I asked. The TV didn't say, answered Silly Willie. The distress was obviously in his voice. We was around back in Pipe Alley checking TV when a special bulletin came on. All they said was Malcolm X was shot and they were rushing him to the hospital. Thanks, I said to Silly Willie. I felt his reassuring hand on my shoulder as he faded away in the darkness. For a moment, I pondered whether to go outside and get more information, but something made me hang back. I remember distinctly thinking that I would know soon enough. On the screen before me, Victor Buono had a woman by the throat and was frantically choking the last gasping twitches of life out of her sunken body. I was thinking that if Malcolm's wounds were not too serious, that if he recovered, the shooting might prove to be a blessing in disguise. It would focus more intensified intention on him and create a windfall of sympathy and support for him throughout America's black ghettos, and so put more power into his hands. The possibility that the wounds may have been fatal that as I sat there, Malcolm was lying already dead, was excluded from my mind. After the movie ended, as I filed outside in the long line of convicts and saw the shocked, wild expression on Brother Jay's face, I still could not believe that Malcolm X was dead. We mingled in the crowd of convicts milling around in the yard and were immediately surrounded by a group of Muslims all of whom, like myself, were firm supporters of Malcolm X. He's dead, 
their faces said, although not one of them spoke a word. As we stood there in silence, two Negro inmates walked by and one of them said to us, that's a goddamn shame how they killed that man of all people why they killed Malcolm why don't they kill some of them Uncle Tom and motherfuckers I wish I could get my hands on whoever did it and he walked away talking and cursing to his buddy what does one say to his comrades at the moment when the leader falls all comment seems irrelevant. If the source of death is so-called natural causes or an accident, the reaction is predictable, a feeling of impotence, humbleness, helplessness before the forces of the universe. But when the cause of death is an assassin's bullet, the overpowering desire is for vengeance. One wants to strike out, to kill, crush, destroy to deliver a telling counterblow, to inflict upon the enemy a reciprocal equivalent loss. But whom does one strike down at such a time if one happens to be in an anonymous, amorphous crowd of convicts in Folsom Prison, and the leader lies dead thousands of miles away across the continent? I'm going to my cell, I told the tight little knot of Muslims. Allah is the best knower. Everything will be made manifest in time. Give it a little time. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. The brothers returned the salutation and we shook hands all around. The double handshake which is very popular among Muslims in California prisons. It is so popular that one sometimes grows weary of shaking hands. If a Muslim leaves a group for a minute to go get a drink of water, he is not unlikely to shake hands all around before he leaves and again when he returns. But no one complains and the convention is respected as a gesture of unity, brotherly love, and solidarity. So meaningful in a situation where Muslims are persecuted and denied recognition and the right to function as a legitimate religion. I headed for my cell. I lived in number five building, which is Folsom's honor unit, reserved for those who have maintained a clean record for at least six months. Advantages, a larger cell, TV every Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday night, less custodial supervision, easier ingress and egress, if while living in the honor unit you get into a quote beef which results in action against you by disciplinary committee one of the certain penalties is that you are immediately kicked out of the number five building as I walk I might want to unmute um, so I wanted to pause this for a minute and well I guess uh, first give you a chance to uh, uh, you know, say anything that uh, you might want to say as, as well as myself. And then I kind of want to like interject. I, I want I, I thought about this shortly after we started. I should have started this piece with an excerpt from a Malcolm X speech. But I will do that um, before we resume the book. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Like it, it's hard to even think what what the thoughts going through his mind at, at that point would be like right. of course that's a devastating loss and then to you know initially hearing about the shooting of course your first thought is like oh he'll pull through it it's gonna be a blessing in disguise you know and then like oh fuck no he's dead right um and then having to find out about it through the grapevine because he's in prison That must have been so fucking heart wrenching to be stuck there, unable to do anything, to be there for anybody. Dude. 
just man and that whole time to be hoping that he was just in the hospital and surgery just fine you know oh. right um so the excerpt that i'm going to show you um this this malcolm x speech is uh titled the ballot or the bullet i'm sure that uh most of us at this point have at least heard pieces of it obviously i'm not going to play the whole 53 minute speech but i am going to play a seven and a half minute excerpt okay um in retrospect, I really should have done this at the beginning of the episode, but whatever. Shit happens. Right. Better late than never. This afternoon, we want to talk about the ballot or the bullet. The ballot or the bullet explains itself. But before we get into it, since this is the year of the ballot or the bullet, I would like to clarify some things that refer to me personally concerning my own personal position. I'm still a Muslim. That is, my religion is still Islam. My religion is still Islam. I still credit Mr. Muhammad for what I know and what I am. He's the one who opened my eyes. And so today, though Islam is my religious philosophy, my political, economic, and social philosophy is black nationalism. You and I... As I say, if we bring up religion, we'll have differences, we'll have arguments, we'll never be able to get together. But if we keep our religion at home, keep our religion in the closet, keep our religion between ourselves and our God, but when we come out here, we have a fight that's common to all of us against the enemy who is common to all of us. Whether you are, whether you are a Christian or a Muslim or a nationalist, we all have the same problem. They don't hang you because you're a Baptist, they hang you because hang you you're black. They don't attack me because I'm a Muslim, they attack me because I'm black. They attack all of us for the same reason. All of us catch hell from the same enemy. We're all in the same bag, in the same boat. We suffer political oppression, economic exploitation and social degradation, all of them from the same enemy. The government has failed us. You can't deny that. Any time you live in the 20th century and you walking around here singing, we shall overcome, the government has failed. <laughs> this is part of what's wrong with you. You do too much singing. Today, it's time to stop singing and start swinging. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, in case you don't know it, that you got a new, you got a new generation of black people in this country who don't care anything whatsoever about odds. They don't want to hear you old Uncle Tom handkerchief heads talking about uh, the odds. No. This is a new generation. If they're going to draft these young black men and send them over to Korea or South Vietnam to face 800 million Chinese, <laughs> if 
If you're not afraid of those odds, you shouldn't be afraid of these odds. And when I speak, I don't speak as a Democrat or a Republican, nor an American. I speak as a victim of America's so-called democracy. You and I have never seen democracy. All we've seen is hypocrisy. We don't see any American dream. We've experienced only the American nightmare. And the generation that's coming up now can see it and are not afraid to say it. If, if you go to jail, so what? If you're black, you were born in jail. If you're black, you were born in jail. In the North as well as the South. Stop talking about the South. Long as you're south of the, long as you're south of the Canadian border, you're South. This is why I say it's the ballot or the bullet. It's liberty or it's death. It's freedom for everybody or freedom for nobody. America today finds herself in a unique situation. Historically, revolutions are bloody. Oh, yes, they are. They have never had a bloodless revolution or a nonviolent revolution. That don't happen even in Hollywood. You don't have a revolution in which you love your enemy. And you don't have a revolution in which you are begging the system of exploitation to integrate you into it. Revolutions overturn systems. Revolutions destroy systems. A revolution is bloody. But America is in a unique position. She's the only country in history in a position actually to become involved in a bloodless revolution. All she's got to do is give the black man in this country everything that's doing. Everything. I hope that the white man can see this. Because if you don't see it, you're finished. If you don't see it, you're going, to be coming, you're going to become involved in some action in which you don't have a chance. We don't care anything about your atomic bomb. It's, it's useless. Because other countries have atomic bombs. When two or three different countries have atomic bombs, nobody can use it. So it means that the white man today is without a weapon. If, you're gonna, if you want some action, you've got to come on down to earth. And there's more black people on earth than there are white people on earth. It'll be the, the ballot, or it'll be the book. It'll be liberty, or it'll be death. And if you're not ready to pay that price, don't use the word freedom in your vocabulary. Wow. Um, that's... An intense speech every time it's just like wow um, but he's right though and he's uh, echoing a lot of the same sentiments as Mao uh, you know revolution cannot be as, as magnanimous as a painting you know um, a revolution is a violent act in which in which one class overthrows another and Malcolm you know pointed out there has never been a bloodless revolution um, that's <clears throat> that's not new all right well we'll be getting back to the book here Walk the 
along the first tier toward my cell, I ran into Red, who lived near me on the tier. I guess you heard about Malcolm. Yeah, I said. They say he got wasted. Red, who was white, knew from our many discussions that I was extremely partial to Malcolm, and he said himself, being thoroughly alienated from the status quo, recognized the assassination for what it was, a negative blow against a positive force. Red's questions were the obvious ones. Who? Why? The questions were advanced tentatively, cautiously, because of the treacherous ground he was on. A red-headed, blue-eyed white man concerned by an event which so many others greeted with smiles and sighs. I went into my cell. Although I heard it blared over the radio constantly and read about it in all the newspapers, Days passed during which my mind continued to reject the fact of Malcolm's death. I existed in a dazed state, wandering in a trance around Folsom, drifting through the working hours in the prison bakery, and yet I was keen to observe the effect of the assassination on my fellow inmates. From most of the whites there was a leer and a hint of a smile in the eyes. They seemed anxious to see a war break out between the followers of Elijah and the followers of Malcolm. There are only a few Just to interject there, <clears throat> um, the, this uh, comment right there about a war breaking up between the followers of Elijah and the followers of Malcolm. Um, Malcolm mentioned that beef in a way in the beginning of the ballot and the bullet speech. Um, all right, Trisha's back. Hello, comrade. I don't hear you. Oh, sorry about that. I had to step up for a moment. Um, um, obviously I'm back in the book now. I think I've made it like two paragraphs. Um, but I, I mean, okay. it, it's funny because when I paused it, I was talking about how like I can't even imagine what he felt in that moment. And then he's describing it. I existed in a dazed state, wandering in a trance around Folsom, drifting through the working hours in the prison bakery. And yet I was keen to observe the effect of the assassination on my, in, uh, on my fellow inmates. Um, you know, days passed during which my mind continued to reject the fact of Malcolm's death. Um, denial is a stage of grief. Yeah. It's one of those things that's hard to wrap your head around when someone dies unexpectedly. Especially an influential uh, figure like Malcolm X. Right. And uh, I, I literally just said this before you walked up, but uh, they're talking about how the whites seemed anxious to see a war break out between the followers of Elijah and the followers of, uh, of Malcolm. And Malcolm X at the beginning of the ballot, the bullet speech kind of addressed that. Like, I am still a Muslim. I am still a practice, uh, a, a, a practicer, practitioner. Of, of the Islam faith, and I still credit Elijah Muhammad for teaching me everything I know, but... Right. Um, but yeah, that... And I mean, the question of who killed Malcolm X, well, first of all, there's a pretty decent documentary series on it. Um, actually, but... That being said, that's still not solved. I mean, the original people charged with his killing were uh, exonerated because they didn't do it, but that doesn't mean that they've figured out or that they even have any interest in figuring out who did it. Um, 
to be fair, I'm pretty sure it was another government want that also being released because look at how many things have been. Well, they admitted that they killed fucking MLK. Why wouldn't they admit they killed right. Malcolm X? I have a feeling that they, if they were to admit too many fucking murders in a row like that, because they've also admitted Fred Hampton's, then um, it would probably, rightfully so, incite a bunch of fucking revolts. Like, excuse me, what the fuck? Because look at how many leftist leaders the government has executed. And not, like, with a death penalty for actual crimes, but just flat-out murdered for helping their own communities. Or, you know, pointing out that it's either the ballot or the bullet. And the ballot ain't getting us no fucking where. Well, that was kind of the point of that whole fucking speech. Right. Um... Which that being said, if, if you've never if you've never listened to that whole fifty three minute speech, do it. That was like the first eight minutes of it, and he was just starting to get fired up when it cut off. So, right. Um, matter of that's, fact, that's one of the things that really like gets me about Malcolm X speaking. He's so his delivery is so good. Yeah, he really knew how to reach people. Um, will you put the link for that speech in the description too? Uh, yeah, I'll pull it back up now so I don't lose it. Should I do the whole speech or the excerpt that I played? The whole speech. The that way anyone speech. listening that wants to actually hear the whole thing can do so. With annotations and subtitles. Good shit. All right, that will also be in the description. Beautiful. Thank you. All right, I guess uh, let's get back to the text. Okay. A few whites and Folsom with whom I would ever discuss the death of Malcolm or anything else besides baseball or the weather. Many of the Mexican Americans were sympathetic, although some of them made a point when being observed by whites of letting drop sly remarks indicating they were glad Malcolm was gone. Among the Negroes there was mass mourning for Malcolm X. Nobody talked much for a few days. The only Negroes who were not indignant were a few of the Muslims who remained loyal to Elijah Muhammad. They interpreted Malcolm's assassination as the will of Allah descending upon his head for having gone astray. Doesn't sound a whole lot like evangelists. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, you were backsliding. You deserved it. Like, get right, the like here. Ah. Mm-mm. That's some bullshit that I don't care for. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was the... Uh, part of the part of the break between Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad was that, like, cult-like mentality. Right. The um, extreme fundamentalist stuff that... Is not applicable in today's society. Agreed. There's no place for it, you know? In the dogma. And a lot of the dogma. Right. Um, just lost the message. For sure. To them, it was divine chastisement and a warning to those whom Malcolm had tempted. 
it was not so much Malcolm's death that made them glad, but in their eyes it now seemed possible to heal the schism in the movement and restore the monolithic unity of the nation of Islam, a unity they looked back on with some nostalgia. Many Negro convicts saw Malcolm's assassination as a historic turning point in black America. Really was. Whereas Negroes often talk heatedly about wiping out all the so-called Negro leaders whom they do not happen to like or agree with, this was the first significant case of Negro leader killing that anyone could remember. What struck me is that the Negro convicts welcomed the new era. If a man is valuable to us as Malcolm could go down, then, as far as I was concerned, so could any other man, myself included. Coming a week after the alleged expose of the alleged plot to dynamite the Statue of Liberty, Washington Monument, and the Liberty Bell, a plot supposedly hatched by discontented blacks, the assassination of Malcolm X had put new ideas in the wind with implications for the future of black struggle in America. I suppose that like many of the brothers and sisters in the Nation of Islam movement, I also had clung to the hope that somehow the rift between Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad would be mended. As long as Brother Malcolm was alive, many Muslims could maintain this hope neatly overlooking the increasing bitterness of their rivalry. But death made the split final and sealed it for history. These events caused a profound personal crisis in my life and beliefs, as it did for other Muslims. During the bitter time of his suspension and prior to his break with Elijah Muhammad, we had watched Malcolm X as he sought frantically to reorient himself and establish a new platform. It was like watching a master do a dance with death on a high strung tightrope. He pirouetted, twirled, turned somersaults in the air, but he landed firmly on his feet and was off and running. We watched it all, seeking a cause to condemn Malcolm X and cast him out of our hearts. We read all the charges and countercharges. I found Malcolm X blameless. It had been my experience that the quickest way to become hated by the Muslims was to criticize Elijah Muhammad or disagree with something he wrote or said. If Elijah wrote, as he has done, that the swine is a poison creature composed of one-third rat one-third cat and one-third dog and you attempted to cite scientific facts to challenge this you had sinned against the light that was all there was to it how much more unlikely was it therefore that Muslims would stand up and denounce Elijah himself repudiate his authority and his theology deny his revelation and take sides against him the messenger of Almighty God, Allah. I never dreamed that some day I would be cast in that hapless role. After Malcolm made his pilgrimage to Mecca, completing a triumphal tour of Africa and the Near East, during which he received the high honors of a visiting dignitary, he returned to the USA and set about building his newly founded organization of Afro-American unity. He also established the Muslim Mosque Incorporated to receive the Muslims he thought would pull away from Elijah. The Muslim Mosque would teach Orthodox Islam under the direction of Sheikh Ahmed Hassoun from the holy city of Mecca. Grand Sheikh Mohammed Sarur al Saban, Secretary General of the Muslim World League, had offered the services of Sheikh Ahmed according to the Los Angeles Herald-Dispatch to, quote, 
help Malcolm X in his efforts to correct the distorted image that the religion of Islam has been given by hate groups in this country. I began defending Malcolm And that was just completely like, that completely saw a resurgence following the 9-11 attacks, which was exactly what they were pushing for. I mean, it still, it still shines through in our society today. If anything, it's gotten worse over the last 20 years. You had to put a number there, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's how long it's been since 9-11. The inside job that got blamed on Middle Eastern people that didn't actually fucking do it. It's kind of funny because there's shit like one of the people who was accused of hijacking one of the planes showed up not long after in South America going, I don't know how the fuck they have my passport. How are they finding my passport? How does a passport survive an explosive fire like that? It doesn't. There's too many things that don't add up. Um, but yeah, it it was an easy target to paint. The backs of Islamic people. Well, not ours. We don't claim them. But the U.S. government has a tendency to do shit like that of here, distraction tactics. Look over here so you don't see what's actually going on over there. Um, At that moment, what was going on over there was the government setting itself up to be able to pass fucking stricter laws removing human rights. Which they did. Which they did. With the Patriot Act and then Obama fucking took even more power with the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012. Yep. Shit like definite or indefinite detention of American citizens without representation, without trial. Without fucking charges. Yeah. You just get disappeared under an accusation. And then gave themselves more than enough rope to hang everybody in the country by when it comes to how they were determining who qualifies as a fucking terrorist because they were saying shit like, if you always have a camera on you, motherfucker, every fucking phone has a camera on it, so everybody always has a camera on you everywhere you go. Or if you have two weeks worth of food in your home, you must be a terrorist. What? Which, on the other hand, the government says that you should have two to three weeks of food in your home. So, like, make that make sense. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, they literally had expanded their list of bullshit of anything they could think of, um, to be able to point the finger at literally any fucking buddy and be like, see, you're a terrorist. You, you did something completely fucking normal that just so happens to be our list of bullshit. Oh, that one still angers me. Yeah, most of our government needs to be brought up on fucking charges. But anyway, with that one, yeah. Yep, that was nothing but xenophobia. Trying to, you know, just influence a whole bunch more fucking division with more racist shit, more xenophobic shit. It was that that's the MO of the US. Been demonizing Islam when to be fair, every fucking almost not every almost every fucking terrorist act that's ever happened on this soil 
was perpetrated by white Christian males, statistically speaking. Who is the real terrorist? And you know what? Most of them use their fundamentalist fucking ideals, their reasoning for committing said terror, like blowing up women's health clinics, things like that, you know. Um, this country's crazy. That it is. Lots of denial and deflection. Like, I know we're doing all the bad shit, but we're not the bad guys. They're the bad guys. No. <laughs> but I digress. As a little extra of a rant. Because everything surrounding all of that fucking angers me. As it should. It should anger all of us. Um, that being said, though, I'm going to jump back to the text. Comex, at a secret meeting of the Muslims in Folsom, I announced that I was no longer a follower of Elijah Muhammad, that I was throwing my support behind Brother Malcolm. I urged everyone there to think the matter over and make a choice because it's no longer possible to ride two horses at the same time. On the wall of my cell, I had a large framed picture of Elijah Muhammad, which I had had for years. I took it down, destroyed it, and in its place put up, in the same frame, a beautiful picture of Malcolm X, kneeling down in the Muhammad Ali Mosque in Cairo which I clipped from the Saturday Evening Post. At first, the other Muslims in Folsom denounced me. Some I had known intimately for years stopped speaking to me or even looking at me. When we met, they averted their eyes. To them, the choice was simple. Elijah Muhammad is the hand-picked messenger of Allah, the instrument of Allah's will. All who oppose him are aiding Allah's enemy, the white devils. Whom do you choose, God or the devil? <coughs> Malcolm X, in the eyes of Elijah's followers, had committed the unforgivable heresy when changing his views and abandoning the racist position, he admitted the possibility of brotherhood between blacks and whites. In a letter sent back to the U.S. from the Holy Land, Malcolm X had stated, You may be shocked by these words coming from me, but I have always been a man who tries to face facts and to accept the reality of life as new experience and knowledge unfolded. The experiences of this pilgrimage have taught me much, and each hour in the Holy Land opens my eyes even more. I have eaten from the same plate with people whose eyes were the bluest of blue, whose hair was the blondest of blonde and whose skin was the whitest of white and I felt the sincerity in the words and deeds of these white Muslims that I felt among the African Muslims of Nigeria Sudan and Ghana many of us were shocked and outraged by these words from Malcolm X who had been a major influence upon us all and the main factor in many of our conversions to the black Muslims. But there were those of us who were glad to be liberated from a doctrine of hate and racial supremacy. The onus of teaching racial supremacy and hate, which is the white man's burden, is pretty hard to bear. Asked if he would accept whites as members of his organization of Afro-American unity, Malcolm said he would accept John Brown if he were around today, which certainly is setting the standard high. Mm -hmm. At the As moment I declared myself for Malcolm X, I had some prestige among the Muslims in the prisons of California because of my active role in proselytizing new converts 
and campaigning for religious freedom for Muslim convicts. We sent a barrage of letters and petitions to the courts, government officials, even the United Nations. After the death of Brother Booker T. X., who was shot dead by a San Quentin prison guard, and who at the time had been my cell partner and the inmate minister of the Muslims of San Quentin, my leadership of the Muslims of San Quentin had been publicly endorsed by Elijah Muhammad's West Coast representative, Minister John Shabazz of Muhammad's Los Angeles Mosque. This was done because of the explosive conditions in San Quentin at the time. Muslim officials wanted to avert any Muslim-initiated violence, which had become a distinct possibility in the aftermath of Brother Booker's death. I was instructed to impose an iron discipline upon the San Quentin Mosque, which had continued to exist despite the unending efforts of prison authorities to stamp it out. Most of the Muslims who were in prison during these days have since been released. I was one of the few remaining, and I was therefore looked upon by the other Muslims as one who had sacrificed and invested much in the struggle to advance the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. For that reason, my defection to Malcolm X caused a great deal of consternation among the Muslims of Folsom. But slowly, Malcolm was getting his machine together, and it was obvious to me that his influence was growing. Negro inmates who had had reservations about Malcolm while he was under Elijah's authority now embraced him, and it was clear that they accepted Malcolm's leadership. Negroes, whom we had tried in vain for years to convert to Elijah's fold, now lined up with enthusiasm behind Malcolm. I ran a regular public relations campaign for Malcolm and Folsom. I saw to it that copies of his speeches were made and circulated among Negro inmates. I never missed a chance to speak favorably about Malcolm, to quote him, to explain and justify what he was trying to do. Soon I had the ear of the Muslims, and it was not long before Malcolm had other ardent defenders in Folsom. In a very short time, Malcolm became the hero of the vast majority of Negro inmates. Elijah Muhammad was quickly becoming irrelevant. Passe. Malcolm X had a special meaning for black convicts. A former prisoner himself, he had risen from the lowest depths to great heights. For this reason, he was a symbol of hope, a model for thousands of black convicts who found themselves trapped in the vicious PPP cycle. Prison, parole, prison. One thing that the judge... We call that the revolving prison door nowadays, but uh, I would say it's even worse now. But it was obviously um, a significant problem then as well. Yeah. Sadly, that's something that the government saw as being a motherfucking profiteering opportunity. Look at how much the prison system's grown since. It was already needing real the fuck in. And instead, it's only grown. We literally have more people imprisoned here than the Gulag ever did, but I digress. All right, back to the text. Judges, policemen, and administrators of prison seem never to have understood, and for which they certainly do not make any allowances, is that Negro convicts basically, rather than see themselves as criminals and perpetrators of misdeeds, look upon themselves as prisoners of war. The victims of a vicious dog-eat-dog -dog social system that is so heinous as to cancel out their own malefactions. In the jungle, there is no right or wrong. Rather than owing and paying a debt to society, Negro prisoners feel that they are being abused, that their imprisonment 
is simply another form of the oppression which they have known all their lives. Negro inmates feel that they are being robbed, that it is society that owes them, that should be paying them a debt. America's penology does not take this into account. Malcolm X did, and black convicts know that the ascension to power of Malcolm X, or a man like him, would eventually have revolutionized penology in America. Malcolm delivered a merciless and damning indictment of prevailing penology. It is only a matter of time until the question of the prisoner's debt to society versus society's debt to the prisoner is injected forcefully into national and state politics, into the civil and human rights struggle, and into the consciousness of the body politic. It is an explosive issue which goes to the very root of America's system of justice, the structure of criminal law, the prevailing beliefs and attitudes toward the convicted felon. While it is easier to make out a case for black convicts, the same principles apply to white and Mexican-American convicts as well. They too are victimized, albeit a little more subtly, by, quote, society. When black convicts start demanding a new dispensation and definition of justice, naturally the white and Mexican-American convicts will demand equality of treatment. Malcolm X was a focus for these aspirations. The black Muslim movement was destroyed the moment Elijah cracked the whip over Malcolm's head, because it was not the black Muslim movement itself that was so irresistibly appealing to the true believers. It was the awakening into self-consciousness of 20 million Negroes which was so compelling. Malcolm X articulated their aspirations better than any other man of our time. When he spoke under the banner of Elijah Muhammad, he was irresistible. When he spoke under his own banner, he was still irresistible. If he had become a Quaker, a Catholic, or Seventh-day Adventist, or a Sammy Davis-style Jew, and if he had continued to give voice to the mute ambitions in the black man's soul, his message would still have been triumphant, because what was great was not Malcolm X, but the truth he uttered. The truth which Malcolm uttered had vanquished the whole passel of so-called Negro leaders and spokesmen who trifle and compromise with the truth in order to curry favor with the white power structure. He was stopped in the only way such a man can be stopped, in the same way that the enemies of the Congolese people had to stop Lumumba by the same method that exploiters, tyrants, and parasitical oppressors have always crushed the legitimate strivings of people for freedom, justice, and equality by murder, assassination, and mad dog butchery. What provoked the assassins to murder? Did it bother them that Malcolm was elevating our struggle into the international arena through his campaign to carry it before the United Nations? Well, by murdering him, they only hastened the process, because we certainly are going to take our cause before a sympathetic world. Did it bother the assassins that Malcolm denounced the racist straitjacket demonology of Elijah Muhammad? Well, we certainly do denounce it and will continue to do so. Did it bother the assassins that Malcolm taught us to defend ourselves? We shall not remain a defenseless prey to the murderer, to the sniper, and the bomber. In so far as Malcolm spoke the truth, the truth will triumph and prevail, and his name shall live. And in so far as those who opposed him lied, to that extent will their names become curses, because truth crushed to earth shall rise again. So now Malcolm is no more. The bootlickers, Uncle Toms, lackeys, and stooges of the white power structure have done their best to denigrate Malcolm, to rule him out of his people's hearts, to tarnish his memory. But their million-worded lies fall on deaf ears, as Ozzie Davis so eloquently expressed it in his immortal eulogy of Malcolm.
If you knew him, you would know why we must honor him. Malcolm was our manhood, our living black manhood. This was his meaning to his people. And in honoring him, we honor the best in ourselves. However much we may have differed with him, or with each other about him, and his value as a man, let his going from us serve only to bring us together now. Consigning these mortal remains to earth, the common mother of all, secure in the knowledge that what we place in the ground is no more now a man, but a seed, which, after the winter of our discontent, will come forth again to meet us, and we will know him then for what he was and is, a prince, our own black shining prince who didn't hesitate to die because he loved us so we shall have our manhood we shall have it or the earth will be leveled by by our attempts to gain it should have been the end of that line I don't know why it ended so abruptly um Hang on just a second. I messed up. I closed that. There we go. All right. Um, so that brings us to the end of uh, not only that chapter, but that section. Ah, but that section. Son of a... Okay, so uh, two weeks from now, when we pick this book back up, we will be going into part two, uh, titled Blood of the Beast. Um, looks like we're a little under um, halfway done with the book. Um, before I wrap this up, I, I really like... Um, this this excerpt from the eulogy of Mal Malcolm X. Um, Consigning these mortal remains to earth, the common mother of all, secure in the knowledge that what we place in the ground is no more now a man, but a seed, which after the winter of our discontent will come forth again to meet us. I mean, basically, he's saying that his ideas live on. He planted a bunch of seeds and those seeds are going to come to fruit. <clears throat> Welcome back. Are you there? Um, The, the, the point is, is um, the, the, the best way to honor someone you care about is to um, honor the best in ourselves. Um, I, I really like that excerpt from that eulogy. Um, anyway, as I said, two weeks from now when we come back into this book, we will be in part two which is titled Blood of the Beast. That's going to be page 99 in the PDF that we've been using. Um, yeah, I think that's all I got. Join us next Tuesday for our current event stream. And um, I think we're going to have a few... Uh, <sighs> Sorry, things for you next week. Um, I'm going to try to put together a shorter piece on dialectical materialism. Um, I'm, I'm sure Trish will probably be part of that too. Are you muted? Yep, my mic was muted. Sorry <laughs> about that. I, I lip read, things. yes, I am. <laughs> 
Yep. Yeah. My my signal kept cutting out. I mean, that's okay. At least you were able to read the book with it, even if the audio book kept cutting out for you. That's funny. Emily sent a picture of sober me to a group chat with Justin and uh, <laughs> that's great. Anyway, Justin said he looks like he's contemplating murder. That's what I laughed about. Yeah. Did it again. Oh, wow. That's annoying. Um, yeah. 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 So yeah. I'm not totally sure if exam info has part two of the book. Damn it. Is that whose audio book we're using? Yeah. I'm trying to figure that out before I end this, though, because, well, I hope we don't have to go back to reading it out loud after that. Well, if they don't have part two recorded yet, um, maybe someone else does. They have a lot of videos. Holy shit. That's what's up. Okay, they do have, they have the whole book. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, okay. So we will continue to use the same audio book. Um, obviously, we'll be using the same PDF as well. Um, but we will be speaking of the revolutionary left book club. Um, we will have something cool to announce in the future. Uh, minister of culture of the new African black Panther party, Kwame Shakur, um, recently released his autobiography, um, which is kind of, you know, his story of where he started and how he got where he is. Um, and it, it, it really follows along the same line, you know, like Eldridge Cleaver and Malcolm X, obviously were both in prison and that changed their lives for the better. Um, it, it's, it's another story like that. And, uh, he started organizing in prison and then now he's out on the streets doing serve the people programs twice a week. I mean, it's. It's a, it's a pretty uplifting story. I'm not that far into it yet, but the prologue had me hooked right off the bat. Like, holy fuck. <laughs> that was pretty much everyone's response to the prologue. Like, whoa, that's fucking wild. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, but we will also be discussing the book uh, with him. And then he is doing a group reading much like we do with these except for in a zoom meeting so you know there's a bunch of people in it um but we may be working on broadcasting that like you know in partnership with them um that's not official yet so if it doesn't happen don't be offended but we will be sharing their thing uh either way and i encourage you to buy the book um I mean, we just messaged him on Facebook, sent him the money, and he sent us the books. Uh, it's also available on Amazon, so if you need to, like, ship it to someone you know in prison, for example, um, you can buy it on Amazon and do it that way. So, um, 
seriously though, I, I, I hope that everybody takes the time to read it. Um, also, Mako has a new blog post out. I don't know if it's shared to the page or not. I saw that you shared it to a bunch of groups. Um, yes, I shared it to the page, too. Um, as well as the left signal boost. Uh, and a whole bunch of groups. Hell yeah. Um, this one is about the anniversary of the Wounded Knee Massacre. Um I don't know. I, I guess I don't really need to go much deeper than that. I'm, I'm trying to encourage you to read it, not. <laughs> right. Not give you the content of it. Go look for yourself. It is on our page. It's an excellent read. Also, I know you can't click it, but um, there is the link to um, Nico's blog. Why couldn't I think of the word? I don't know. It's right there in front of your face at the end of the link. Uh, yeah, it literally <laughs> is. It literally is. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he's. Well, I guess he wouldn't be going live this week because he would have done that today. I think he was wanting to do biweekly. I got to sit down with him and, and see what's well, up. Well, yeah, that, that's what I thought, too. But he didn't do it last week, either. It was the week before. Um, I'll touch base with him and see if he still needs a hand with the software itself. Like for That's us fair. Because um, we did only get to do one run through with him, showing him the software. That's true. Um. But yeah, I mean, I was I was really hoping that he was going to do a piece about that, to be honest, because there, there's a lot to that situation and he didn't, you know, there's always more that you can dive into when you're talking about it as opposed to a blog post. Right. Um, but, you know, just to get his extra thoughts on that, I, I would have really liked an episode for that. But that being said, um there's a lot of information in the blog post and I still encourage you to read it. Um, and we'll, we'll see about having him on for a uh, discussion about it, or at least, um, you know, if nothing else, if you can record a video and uh, we can show that during one of our streams, I, I would, I would like to have some airtime dedicated to it either way. Right. Absolutely. Um, that being said, though, I believe the next time you'll see us is probably going to be Tuesday. Um, and then we'll have a couple of things coming at, uh, coming your way next week. So, uh, the return of Emma Goldman. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I think that's all I got, though. Do you have anything else? Uh, not that I can think of offhand. Fair enough. All right. Well, I guess um, on that note, I will put up this fancy social media overlay and play the damn song. Fuck. <laughs>
Who's going to